I'd like to welcome everyone once again to this month's Wildlife for Lunch webinar. Today's webinar is on patterns of supplemental feed consumption in white-tailed deer, presented by Emily Belser with Caesar Clayburg Wildlife Research Institute. Today's webinar is made possible through funding provided by San Antonio Livestock Exposition Incorporated, and it's hosted by the Texas Wildlife Association and Texas A&M AgriLife Extension. Emily, with that, you should have controls and you're ready to go. Okay, great. Thanks, Clint. Like you said, I'll be presenting on supplemental feed consumption patterns in South Texas. Um, but before I get started, I kind of I want to acknowledge a few co-authors. Um, without all of these people, this, the, some of the research that I'll be talking about today would not have been possible. Um, first is Dr. Dave Hewitt, Dr. Tim Fulbright, and Dr. Charlie DeYoung uh, with Texas A&M Kingsville. Um, they helped design a lot of the research that I'll be talking about. Um, I also want to acknowledge Dr. Wester, also with Caesar Kleber. Um, he has been highly instrumental in um, analyzing all of the data that I'll be talking about. And of course, Mr. Donnie Drager with the Comanche Ranch. Um, so before we talk about um, how supplemental feed can affect a deer's nutrition, we need to talk about what nutrition is. Um, nutrition is the process by which an animal obtains chemicals and energy from its environment for use in metabolism, growth, and reproduction. Um, deer don't necessarily have a need for the specific plants that they eat. What they have a need for are these different nutrients that they can get from the plants. Um, so they need energy. Energy is necessary for um, and everything a deer does, like movement, cell metabolism, anything like that. Um, they also need protein. Protein is what a deer is made of. Um, protein is uh, made of a, a chain of amino acids, and deer need about 8 to 9 percent protein um, in their diet for maintenance. They also need minerals and vitamins. Um, ma mainly what these are for is they're a component, a component of enzymes, and um, they serve structural purposes for enzymes and hormones. Um, deer also need water. These requirements are highly variable. Um, it's been estimated that they need about one and a half to three and a half quarts a day. Um, so the requirements that deer have can vary. Um, they can vary by sex. So bucks are going to have different nutrient requirements than does. Um, it can be different by age. So young deer, like fawns, are going to need more energy and protein for growth compared to, to an adult. And then also the nutri nutritional requirements can vary by season. So a doe is not going to have the same requirements during most of the year um, as compared to when she is during parturition and lactation. And then, of course, bucks are going to have different requirements during the year, such as when they're growing antlers. They're going to have a lot higher um, protein requirements. And these nutritional requirements can also vary by individual. So even though these two bucks in this picture um, are probably about the same age, and they're both bucks, um, even um, between the two of them, the nutritional requirements can vary. And nutrition, nutrition can also be very variable within the environment. So this is a picture taken um, in South Texas in August of 2006. And you can see there's not a lot of green stuff there. Um, some of the, the shrubs and brush is still green, but there's really not many forbs available for the deer to eat. But if you go back to that same location, this was taken in August of 2007 in the same spot, and there's so much green stuff out there for the deer to eat. So you can see there's a big difference um, even in the environment. This is a different location taken in spring. This is a picture taken in spring 2010. And you can see there's all kinds of food out there for deer to be eating. But in, the, but in that same location in spring 2011, there's really nothing green in there. And so with such a complexity of nutrition due to the vegetation constantly changing and requirements being different between deer, how can we manage for deer nutrition? The best thing we can do is to provide a choice. Deer have this ability to choose a diet to meet their needs, so they're able to pick out the things that they know that they need. So the first category of foods that they eat are forbs. These are moderate to high energy, they have a lot of protein, and they're relatively low in toxins. That's going to deter deer from eating them. Um, forbs are preferred, but they're very, their availability is pretty sporadic, especially in South Texas um, when uh, they're highly dependent on rainfall. The next category is browse. These are your shrubs, and they have a moderate energy, moderate protein, and then, but they do have moderate to high toxins. Um, one of the good things about shrubs is that they're pretty much available continually. 
The next category is grasses. Deer really don't eat a lot of grasses. Um, they will eat them when they're young um, because they have moderate to high energy and protein, but as they mature, um, grasses really don't have a lot of good things in them that deer are going to want to eat. And then another category is mast. Um, this is the fruits like acorns and the sweet beans. Um, and these have high energy and a lot of fat, but their availability is very sporadic. They're not going to be available during all times of the year. So this is some data from my um, PhD project. This is data out of from a couple ranches out in Creva Springs. Um, and this is prickly pear and mesquite mast during the summer. Um, and these are the maximum values that I found. So I went out and I counted the mass availability in the summers of 2014, 2015, and 2016, and that's your x-axis. And then you have pounds per acre on the y-axis. And then prickly pear is the pink, and mesquite is the green. So prickly pear, you can see that across all years, um, the availability is pretty steady. Um, there is a little bit of variation, but pretty much every year they're, they're pretty reliable. They're always going to be producing mass. But if you look at mesquite beans production, um, mesquite, there are a lot of mesquite beans in 2014. 2014 was a pretty dry summer. Um, 2015, you can see that number drops off to really low um, compared to 2014. And 2015 was a very um, wet, we had a lot of rainfall um, in the late spring, early summer. And so the mesquite just really did not produce a lot of beans. And then this past summer in 2016, um, we have, a, I guess, a little bit more rain than 2014, but not as much as 2015. And you can see that the mesquite bean production is kind of moderate there. So this goes to show that it's really good to have a good variety of plants out there because, you know, prickly pear are going to be pretty, they're going to have a pretty constant and steady, um, reliable source of fruits in the summer. But if you look at mesquite, they can be, um, they can have really high production during some years, um, but not, but they can be really low in other years. Um, and mesquite, Bean production is interesting because they seem to produce more beans during times of drought um, compared to times when you have a lot of rain. And so usually when you have a drought, other um, plants are not producing mass. So it may make these mesquite beans even more important during those times. So given all of this variation in nutritional requirements and food availability, uh, many deer managers have begun providing supplemental feed for deer, particularly in South Texas, where the environment is highly variable and very dependent on rainfall. And there are a lot of benefits that the feed can provide to deer. Um, these are just a couple of examples, and I'll go into more detail here in a minute. Um, so first is reproduction. Um, so you can imagine if you have uh, increased nutrition, that can affect parturition and lactation for does. Um, providing supplemental feed can also increase body growth as well as antler growth, and it, and it can also increase survival and affect other population parameters. So a lot of the research that I will be presenting um, is coming from the Comanche Faith Research Project. This is done on the Comanche Ranch and the Faith Ranches out in Carrizo Springs, Texas. And during the first phase of this project, they had 12 200-acre enclosures, and in each enclosure, um, they either had a certain deer density and the deer had access to feed and there was a feeder or they had another enclosure that had the same number of deer whereas the deer did not have access to feed. So you have six enclosures that had feed and six that did not. And each year we would catch these deer um, and move them around to adjust our numbers if we needed to and get different measurements off of them. So this is, um, so the first slide is fawn production. So reproduction in young does is very sensitive to nutrition. So if your fawns are being bred as in that first year, if they're cycling through, then that means that um, you have really good nutrition. And so what we found is that 31% of the female fawns with access to feed were pregnant compared to 12.5% um, fawns that were, not, that were pregnant with that did not have access to feed. So fawn production can be very um, nutritionally demanding. And so you can imagine that um, raising fawns is going to have high nutrient requirements. And so you would expect the feed to influence fawn to doe ratios. And that's um, this, is, this is data taken from a ranch in Texas. So you can see that their fawn to doe ratio is just kind of rocking along pretty steady. And then about the mid-90s, it just really takes off and increases. 
Um, so what happened was this ranch implemented a feed program in the mid-90s that really increased their fawn to doe ratio. So their fawns were surviving um, a lot better than they had been before. Um, for body growth, high rates result in large, healthy, productive adult deer. So this is data taken from fawns. This is fawn growth rate. Um, these are December weight differences. Uh, these are taken from December weight differences. So you can see that the fed deer are in yellow and the unfed are in green. Um, you can see that for both females and males, the, the deer that had access to feed um, had a higher growth rate than deer that did not have access to feed. If we look at yearlings, um, it's the same thing. So yellow is the fed enclosures and green is the unfed enclosures. You can see that the fed deer had a higher growth rate than the unfed. You might notice also that the female growth rate, there's a smaller gap between the fed and unfed compared to the male deer. So there's a higher gap for the male deer. And probably one of the explanations for this is that um, it's because of some of these does being bred early, they may have had may have had to put that higher nutrition um, towards pr trying to produce a fawn, whereas the males were able um, to, to put that extra energy and nutrition into body growth. So this is data taken from some of the tame deer that they had in the enclosures. Um, and you can see that the deer that had access to supplement, this is body condition score. So the deer that had access to supplement were consistently higher and in better body condition than deer that did not have supplement. Um, and these are taken um, across four different seasons. You can see that um, the deer with supplement always had a higher um, body condition score. So that means they were healthier. Um, so for body growth, this is, um, so Bartoskowitz in 2003 wrote a paper um, looking at the differences between fed deer and unsupplementally fed deer. And he found that bucks that had eaten feed were 10 to 20 pounds heavier, but there were no differences in body weight in females. Um, so we know that antler size can be um, definitely be, be influenced by nutrition. Um, antlers are influenced by many things, um, including genetics, age, the environment, and of course nutrition. Um, in that same study, Bartoskowitz found that bucks that had eaten feed on one of two ranges had 15 inch larger antlers, um, especially in the three year old deer. Um, that it was really evident in that age class. Um, but he didn't find any differences on another ranch. So this is more data from the Comanche Fates project. Um, so the first category is, um, is the number, so on the X axis is the number of antler points. And on the y-axis is the percent of deer. Um, so the supplemented deer are the black bars, and the unsupplemented deer are the gray bars. So that first category is less than three antler points. So these are your spikes. Um, and you can see that the, there were more spikes in the unsupplemented uh, enclosures than there were in the supplemented enclosures. You can see that the supplemented enclosures had more of an even distribution across um, the number of antler points. Um, and then, of course, survival needs to be high for bucks to be able to mature. And so you're going to assume that you have a high survival when you're delaying harvest of your mature bucks and you're waiting for them to get bigger. So if we look at survival, the yellow in the, or the top line is the survival rates for deer that had access to feed. And then the green line or the bottom line is the, um, is the numbers for deer that did not have access to feed. And you can see that survival is higher um, in the enclosures that had access to feed compared to deer that did not have access to feed. So you can also see that the, um, there's a difference in the annual rate of population change. So if you have a rate of one, that means your population is not changing very much. It's pretty much maintaining itself. If the population is, um, if you have a rate above one, that means your population is growing. So the solid line is your supplemented deer, um, and then the dotted line beneath it is your unsupplemented deer. And you can see that the deer with access to feed had a pretty steady um, high annual rate of population change, and then your unsupplemented deer had a lower rate of population change. So your deer that had access to feed, the population was in steadily increasing. Um, but the deer that did not have access to feed were, were staying at about one. So they are pretty much maintaining themselves. So 
Um, we know that anecdotally seed is going to increase deer density, and we still don't fully understand um, the consequences of that. And so this could begin to be a problem. So some of the concerns that we have about supplemental feed, um, there's a lot of these, and I'll go into more detail about them here in a minute. Um, but first, is the ex it can be expensive. It may take time to see the results. It can increase. You may have to increase your harvest um, to keep up with the high numbers of deer. There also may be some habitat effects um, on, the on the vegetation due to an increased numbers of deer. Um, this supplemental feed has also um, been linked to the domestication process of deer. Um, these feed sites could be serving as a site for the transfer of pathogens and parasites. And you could also be losing your feed uh, to non-targets, and this could be costly. And then, of course, social exclusion. And I'll go into a lot more detail about that here in a minute. So the first um, concern is that it, it's expensive. Um, this, the cost can be variable, but it's going to be higher for more effective programs. Um, so it, and you can also have to factor in the cost of your feeders, storing the feed. Um, you have to worry about paying the people to come deliver your feed. And then you're probably going to have to pay some people to uh, put out the feed. And it, it may also take time to see results. So it could take up to 10 years to really see large effects. So if you think about it, it it'll probably take about one to two years to establish a program and get the deer really um, eating the feed. Sometimes it takes a while. And it may take two to four years for a high proportion of deer to begin eating the feed. And it's going to take at least another five years to get your second generation to maturity. So it could be about 10 years till you really even see any effects. And so um, not everyone is patient enough uh, to be able to wait and see these uh, these um, results. Another concern is the increased harvest. Um, so highly productive herds can grow quickly, um, especially white-tailed deer. And so there may be a large effort um, to maintain the proper density. And so you're really going to be spending a lot of time harvesting does to try to keep your population numbers down. There also may be some habitat effects. Um, the supplemental feed could alter deer distribution. So they may be spending more time near the feeders, and they can really have a large impact on the nearby vegetation, because that's going to be um, where they're going to be spending a lot of their time. Um, there's also an idea that it could, be, it could alter deer foraging. And so they may be increasing pressure on some of the preferred species of plants that they really like and not concentrating on other plants. Um, because, this eat, because if they're eating the supplement, this may give them time to go out and find these better foods that they like. Supplemental feed has also um, led to the domestication process of deer. Um, so you could be altering natural selection. You could be see, seeing some behavioral changes in deer. Um, and they may, it may become really reliant on feed. So if a ranch is feeding um, these deer and then they, they sell the ranch and the new owner decides not to feed deer, um, you may have a lot of deer that don't have a lot of food um, if you take that feed away. Um, probably disease is probably the most um, important concern that most people have. Um, so disease risk is going to be greater when you have deer concentrated into one area. Um, we have they have shown that feeding maintained tuberculosis in Michigan deer, um, and it could also be maintaining brucellosis and chronic wasting disease in other cervids. Um, aflatoxin could be a problem in fawns, but it not. We haven't really seen it to be a big issue in adult deer. Um, so we've experimentally tried to increase a diet of greater than 40% um, of like acorns and corn, but the deer really uh, seem to back off of it once you get greater than 40%. So they're really able to self-regulate and realize, hey, I don't feel good. We're going to quit eating this. Um, and there, so far, there have been no cases of disease related to feed programs in Texas. Um, but we could start seeing changes um, here, especially now that we have chronic wasting disease in Texas. Another concern is non-target species. So if these animals are eating feed, it could be increasing their productivity. And it could also be increasing nest predation. So you can imagine if, say, a turkey or a quail has a nest near a feeder, it's much more likely to be predated than a nest, say, further out. 
Um, and it also produces this negative view of native species, especially the javelina. I think the javelina gets a bad reputation um, just because they're they're out there eating the seed, and um, a lot of landowners are not trying to feed javelina; they want to feed deer. Um, so it just really gives them this negative view. Um, and then, of course, if you're not if these animals are eating feed, um, it's, it's a loss of money as well. Um, so use by fawns um, can be low. So these, some of these fences can exclude fawns until they're big enough and have enough energy to jump over the fences. Um, and, so, and they could also be socially excluded from the feeders. And we do know that some deer don't eat feed. Um, in that same study by Bartoskowitz, he found that 30% of the bucks um, were not eating feed and 50 to 90% of does and fawns were not eating feed. So this shows that supplemental feed doesn't totally take care of the population, and we still need to have good native forages. So um, some of the stuff I'm about to talk about now is um, was done by Robin Donahue. He was also on the Comanche Faith Project um, in the earlier phase. And what he found was that um, bucks were always dominant over does, and bucks are also, or mature bucks are also always dominant over yearling bucks and everybody's always dominant over fawns. Fawns are at the um, bottom of the totem pole. During most of the year, um, he found that does and yearling bucks were about um, equally likely to win in interactions. They're about the same level on, on the social hierarchy. But in the spring, when these yearling bucks begin to approach two years of age, then they become more dominant over does. Um, at a population level, like I mentioned before, so age could have an influence on um, which deer are dominant. So adults are going to be dominant over, say, yearlings and fawns. And then, of course, we know that bucks are dominant over does. But if you look at within groups, um, so within doe groups, um, uh, age, body size, and reproductive status have um, been linked to having a higher rank in the social hierarchy. So the older does, the bigger does, and then the does that, ha that have fawns are more likely to be more aggressive and win more interactions at some of these feed sites. And then if you look at within buck groups, um, so age, body size, and antler size have been linked to a, um, to a deer standing in the social hierarchy. So your older bucks, your bigger bucks, and then of course your bucks with uh, bigger antlers are going to have a higher standing in the social hierarchy. So there are two categories of deer behavior. The first is alarm behavior, um, and this is when used when a deer is distressed. So this could be like stamping, snorting, whistling, and lifting the tail. And so I'm sure you've all heard or seen at least one of these behaviors. And if you're in a deer blind, you probably don't want to hear or see one of these behaviors. Um, but the second type of behavior is agonistic behavior. And these are the behaviors that um, happen between two individuals, and it helps to establish the social hierarchy. And so these are the behaviors that I'll kind of, kind of be talking about um, and referring to for um, a lot of this next part of the presentation. And so I'm just going to go over a few of these. Let's see if we can get the video to work here. So for this one, you're going to be watching the doe in the back. And um, you can see that she dropped her ears back here in a second. Yeah, she did right there. And you can see this this other doe is being um, pushed away from the feeder. Let's go to the next one. Get pick and load. OK, so for this one, you're going to be watching the doe on the far left. And you can see she's going to kind of lower her head and then chase this other deer away. So this other deer is not going to have the chance to get access to feed. And a lot of times um, when deer chase each other, I've seen them just full on running at other deer. Um, and so this can really affect um, how deer are able to get access to the feeder. And this is the rear. So the spawn in the back is going to um, rear up and flail its forelegs at the other deer. Um, this other fawn doesn't really seem to care a whole lot. Um, but these interactions do occur between animals of the same age class. And you can see it eventually he kind of moves away, but he's still able to feed. So it's possible that um, some of these interactions are keeping deer from feeding, and then other times it's, it's not a big deal and they just continue eating anyways. So clearly a lot of those deer were being pushed away from the feeder, and this may cause them to be more likely to avoid the feeder. So if a deer population density was high enough, so with the does in this picture here on the left, um, 
be willing to risk an interaction with this buck here um, to be able to have a chance to feed. And would that change if there were more deer? So if you have fewer deer in the enclosure um, or in, in the area, would they be more likely to feed or have a chance to feed? And so these are, this is from some of the behavior work that was done by Robin Donahue. Um, and he found that does and bucks avoided one another at concentrated food sites. So you have deer density on the x-axis and avoidance on the y. Um, and you can see that in all seasons, they did avoid each other. Um, but in the spring, they were more likely to see does and bucks in the same picture um, compared to the other seasons. Um, and so as population density increases, the degree to which does avoided bucks decreases which could again indicate that as population density increases, there's greater pressure at the feed site. And it, this increased pressure may make it more difficult for does to avoid the site when bucks are present, and more does may attempt to feed while bucks are present rather than waiting for them to leave. Um, and like I said, deer density had the largest effect on avoidance during the summer, where does are 4.29 times more likely to avoid bucks at low density than high density. Um, so does may become more aggressive during summer as their nutrient demand increases during late gestation and lactation or to protect fawns from predators or intraspecific competition. So as fawns mature, they're going to become less dependent of their dam for protection. And so similarly, as the year progresses and fawns mature, does may become less assertive and begin to avoid the feed site when bucks are present to a greater degree. Um, furthermore, if population density is high enough to reduce the abundance of high quality forage, does may become more dependent on supplement and spend more time at the feed site, and as a result, be more likely to encounter a buck. So some of the options for does if they um, are not willing to risk having an interaction um, or a negative interaction with another deer, they may wait outside the feed site like these does are doing in this picture. Um, if they are pushed out to the outskirts away from the feeder, they're going to have be exerting more energy to travel to the feed site. And so this may cause them to attempt to feed with bucks present more so than if they had a shorter distance to travel. Um, another option is they may avoid the feed site altogether and they may just not even eat the feed at all. So this is a little bit more um, from Robin Donahue's research. Um, and this this shows, um, so you have deer density on the x-axis and the probability of a buck dominating a doe on the y-axis. So during most of the year, um, autumn, winter, and spring, um, bucks are more likely to dominate a doe, um, but at a decreasing rate um, as deer density increases. Um, and there's a little bit of a different trend in the summertime, um, and this could be because does may be uh, more aggressive um, during the summer than during other times of the year. And you can see that most of those circles um, during summer fall in line with the other months of the year. But then there's this one um, dot that kind of shows up by itself. And that just kind of goes to show that deer are not like lab rats, and they act as individuals. And they may have had maybe some bossy does or wimpy bucks in that one enclosure. So does with fawns may be spending more time alert, and that could increase the amount of aggression that they're showing at these feed sites. Um, and aggression may be apparent only at low population densities. So because as population density increased in that study, the proportion of interactions in which a buck was dominant during the summer grew closer to the proportions observed during the other three seasons. So now we're going to switch gears for a second and talk about feed consumption in relation to all this behavior, um, uh, behavior stuff. So it's important to really understand the value of how much each class of deer rely on bait and supplement. So just because they're in the area of the feed site doesn't necessarily mean that they're actually consuming the feed. So for example, there's this one deer feeding, this buck feeding in the picture, and one in the background that's not eating. So one deer has access to supplement and is eating, but will the other be able to? So given all these things that I've talked about, um, the those involved with the Comanche Faith Research Project started to wonder what are the patterns of feed consumption and why do they matter? So this kind of led us to investigate supplemental feed disappearance from the feeders, um, which has uh, been a huge part of my PhD research. 
So one of the first objectives we wanted to know was what is the loss to non-targets? So we know that we lose a lot of feed to spillage, um, the feed falling out of the feeders, weather, because um, if the feed gets wet um, from the rain, then it can pretty much ruins it. Um, you can lose feed to insects and then non-target animals like raccoons and birds. Um, and we even caught this picture of a coyote eating feed, um, which is pretty interesting. Our second objective, um, we wanted to know what's the effect of rainfall on feed disappearance. So anecdotally, we've noticed that if it rains, um, the deer really seem to back, back off of the eating the feed, and they kind of tend to concentrate more um, on the vegetation. So we wanted to, to know if the rainfall really was having an effect on feed disappearance. So our third objective is what is the effect of increasing deer density on feed consumption? So the social hierarchy that I talked about before um, could be preventing access to the feeder for subordinate deer. So for example, the deer in this picture seems to be avoiding the feeder while this buck is feeding. So, this, so we're now in phase two of the Comanche phase project, and these are much higher deer densities um, than they were using before. Um, they have a lot of, they had a, still had a lot of unanswered questions from the previous phase, so um, they made some changes for the second phase. So here's a study design and uh, where the ranchers are actually located in Texas. Um, so it's being done in the Comanche Ranch and the Fate Ranch, and these are 81 hectare or 200 acre enclosures. Um, and then we do record the amount of rain that falls in the enclosures. We have a couple rain gauges out there that we check regularly. Um, and so these, these enclosures are constructed of eight foot um, tall fencing or high fencing. Um, for consistency, and so to avoid extra variables in the in the enclosures, we try to remove um, the coyotes, feral hogs, and um, javelinas out of the enclosures. However, these fences are not perfect, and sometimes um, those species do enter the enclosures, but we do try to control that. So every year in March, in a March or April, in December of each year. Um, we do a helicopter net gun capture, and so these we try to remove deer or add deer to the enclosures based on population estimates that we get from trail camera surveys. And so, so we do this, try to do this twice a year to really get a good idea of how many deer are in our enclosures. Um, and I also want to mention that our target deer densities may not always be the actual densities um, that are in the enclosures due to natural mortality and then the fawn recruitment each year. So the feed that we used um, has been specially formulated for our research project. Um, another part of my project, I won't go into um, any detail about it for this, for this specific presentation, um, but we are looking at the um, stable isotope ratios in deer tissues um, because we can use those to get an estimate of about how much feed is in each deer's diet. Um, so we have to try to get the feed to have a specific isotope value. Um, so what we use in our feed is ground corn, wheat, cotton seed, um, green apple flavoring, and then various minerals. And this feed is um, fed ad libitum year round um, and out of one of these feeders that you see in the picture. And each feeder is accompanied by a large water trough. So before we sell each feeder, we measure the, um, we try to level the feed out with a broom um, and then measure the distance between the top of the feed to the top of the feeder. Um, and then we fill the feeder and then we take that same measurement. So we take the measurement from the top of the feed to the top of the feeder. And so this, um, using the geometry of the feeder and these measurements, we can get an idea of how much feed um, disappears uh, between each feeder filling. And so well, here's a little bit of our um, statistical analysis. I won't get into it too much. Um, but for each month, we looked at um, th several different variables. Um, so we used a linear mix model to look at um, if deer density um, affected feed disappearance to see if deer density squared affected deep, uh, feed disappearance. Um, and th this deer density squared would cause our line to curve. And I'll explain that here in a, here in a minute. Um, we we're also looking to see if cumulative rainfall affected the amount of feed that disappeared. And then we wanted to see if there was a deer density and rainfall interaction. And then we used a stepwise selection process to determine significant parameters in the model. So here are our results. Um, 
The first thing I want to point out, the intercept, and this may make more sense once I show you a graph here in the next slide, um, but the intercept, these are values for the um, amount of feed that would be lost to non-targets, so raccoons, birds, um, spillage, all of that things. Um, but what we found is that none of our intercepts were um, statistically different from zero. So even though there are these numbers, they range from negative 8 up to 11.9, um, these really aren't any different from zero. Um, the next thing is our number of deer. So these, this is the values um, that are the pounds of feed per deer. So for example, in January, um, about every deer is eating about 1.5 pounds of feed per day. So during most of the year, um, January through July, and then in November, um, the only significant um, variable was the number of deer. So as um, deer density increased or you had more deer in the enclosure, you lost more feed, which makes sense. Um, but if you look at September, October, and December, um, you had both the number of deer and the number of deer squared were significant. And so um, what this did was cause our line to curve, and um, I'll show that here, an example here in a second. Um, and then, of course, in August, August was the only month where rain was significant. Um, and I think a lot of this is probably just due to the um, high variation in rainfall um, across all of the years. So here's an example from April. So you can see this probably makes more sense. So you can see as deer density increases, the feed disappearance per day or pounds per day also increases. Um, and this makes sense. Um, and your deer are probably pretty um, fat and happy in this, this example. So there's your fat and happy deer. Um, and then, of course, our intercept, what I was talking about, those numbers, um, that estimate the feed loss to non-targets is, is circled in red. So these, these were not different from zero. So that suggests minimal loss to non-targets. Um, so here's an example from October. This is what I was talking about, that, that bending line. Um, so as deer density increases, feed disappearance also increases, but it starts to kind of um, increase at a decreasing rate once you get to, like a, to a certain deer density. Um, so what we did, we did a piecewise linear regression um, for this one. And so at f about 45.4 deer per 200 acres um, is about where that line really begins to curve. So what this means is that at this point is when um, you have too many deer and deer are starting to um, not have access to feed. And that equates to about 4.4 .4 acres per deer if you do the, um, the calculations. And so it's, it's very likely that at this deer density, you're starting to have um, a lot of interactions between deer that's preventing them from being able to feed. So for our first objective, um, we really didn't see a lot of losses um, to non-targets because none of our numbers were statistically different from zero. Um, and so that's not to say that they, we weren't losing feed to non-targets. Um, but it definitely suggests that it's probably just, it's probably minimal. So looking at rainfall, so rainfall wasn't significant until August. Um, and like I said, it's probably due to the fact that it, rainfall is just so variable in where we're um, doing this study. And then we also used um, rainfall for the past 90 days in this, um, this analysis. And I think that if we, maybe if we use a tighter time frame, say maybe 30 days prior, um, we may have seen some different results. And then looking at deer density, so for most of the year, deer had equal access to feed. Um, but when you add fawns to the population in the fall and they're starting to eat the feed, um, that line starts to bend like we see in October, um, suggesting that these deer are not having access to the feed. So if we go back to that social hierarchy that I showed before, um, so, um, in a study done by Corey Gann on the same project, he saw that um, about for buck diets, about 86% of their diet was composed of feed. For yearling bucks, it was about 75.1%. For does, it was about 74% of feed in their diets. Um, and then if you look at uh, what the same Bartoskowitz study, he found that um, about 60% of deer diets was composed of feed, and 30% of diets um, for does was composed of feed. 
Um, so this kind of goes to show that um, bucks are going to be eating more feed than yearling bucks who eat more feed than does who eat more feed than fawns, even though we don't have any numbers for fawns right now. Um, so for management implications, um, so for non-targets, we really didn't see much of an effect. Um, we're really not losing a whole lot of feed to non-targets. Um, rainfall was only influenced, um, only had an influence in August. And again, I think if we had analyzed it differently, we may have found um, a little bit different results. And then also high deer densities may be limiting access to the feeder. So if you have more and more deer, um, you may be, so especially some of your fawns and your does may not have uh, as much access to the feeder as some of your uh, mature animals and your bucks. Um, so with that, I um, pretty quick presentation, but um, I want to acknowledge our major funding sources for the Comanche and Faith Project. Uh, Mr. Dan Freakin of the Comanche Ranch and Mr. Stuart Stedman and the Stedman West Foundation of the Faith Ranch. And then I also want to acknowledge the Houston Safari Club and Mr. Renee Barrientos for other funding. Um, and of course, our technical assistance. Um, this project could not have been done um, without Mr. Wackazell and then all of the many students and um, the technicians and volunteers that have helped on this project. Um, and so with that, I think I can take some questions. Sounds great. Thank you, Emily. Uh, right now, they're going to let you off easy. I don't have any questions that I see. <laughs> okay. uh, but we'll give it a little bit more time. I've got a couple things. If you have questions, uh, please feel free to throw them up there. We still do have time to field questions. I want to direct your attention very quickly to the chat window. Uh, I just posted a link up there. Uh, with this webinar, it wraps up our 2016 Wildlife for Lunch webinar series. Um, at that link, you will see a link for a 2017 webinar um, for the webinar series. In fact, let me grab that link for you right there. That way you have it directly if you want to copy it. Um, so the link that I just posted up will be our 2017 Wildlife for Lunch webinar series. With the exception of one webinar, they're all held on the third Thursday of every month. The one that is not is in February. It's February 23rd rather than the third Thursday. I um, would we'll also direct your attention to one last link. And at this link here, uh, you will find this webinar as well as any other webinars that we've had are archived on that, that link there. And so um, you can go to that link and rewatch this. Give me about a week or so to get it posted up with the holidays. Um, we do have one question that came in. Any differences in the supplemental feed uh, protein versus corn? As, was the feed consistent? Um, well, we really didn't look at any differences between corn versus um, the supplemental feed, um, but we did have corn in our feed. Um, I'm not exactly sure if that was the question you're asking. I guess if uh, Glenn, if you have, if that didn't answer your question, please uh, post it up, and we'll we'll get to that. We had another question come in. Uh, what was your thought concerning the large increase in feed consumption in fall months? Is that a range characteristic or a seasonal requirement? Um. I think that the the large increase in feed consumption in fall months. Um, it's probably probably both. Um, a lot of times we don't get as much rainfall um, during that time of year, so we may not have as much vegetation um, in our enclosures. Um, but also there could be some seasonal requirements. Um, so in the fall, you know, your bucks are trying to put on a lot of fat and body mass to get ready for the rut. Um, and then, of course, the um, feed consumption will decline once they, they get close to the rut. Um, so it could be both. Okay. Uh, as a follow-up to the earlier question, mm -hmm. what did the supplemental feed consist of? I guess can you talk about what the supplemental feed was that was offered? Okay, sure. Um, it was corn and cotton seed were kind of the the main ingredients. Um, there's also wheat in there, and then a lot other minerals. Um, then of course a little bit of green apple flavoring to attract the deer to it. Okay. Um, from what y'all found, what would be the ideal feeder to deer ratio? Uh, that is a really good question. We are actually looking at that 
Um, so, so far, um, so with the stable isotope research that I've done, I didn't present any of that today, but we actually just started analyzing it a few weeks ago. And it's kind of starting to seem that um, we have enclosures with 80 deer and four feeders. Um, and so it seems to be about 20 deer per feeder um, within 200 acres is about um, kind of our ideal deer to feeder ratio. But um, we're not entirely sure about that yet. So that's kind of what we're starting to see. Okay, uh, two part question here. Have you tried peanut skins or rice bran as supplement or attractant? And did y'all find any correlation with soil type and larger antler deer? Um, we have not tried using, um, uh, was it peanut holes um, or rice bran? Um, like I said, we're trying to formulate this feed specifically um, so that we can look at the stable isotope ratios in deer tissues. Um, so you kind of want what they're eating, or the, at least the supplement to be, to have like a specific, um, you can call it a, an isotope signature. Um, so we wouldn't want to add anything different. Um, as far as soil type, soil types on antler size, uh, we haven't really looked at that much with in our enclosures. But I do know that soil type can have an effect on antler characteristics. Um, so if your soil, um, so antlers, it depends on how many minerals and your, the nutrition that the deer have. And of course, your soil type will affect um, what types of vegetation can grow. And so um, there is a relation between soil type and antlers, but we haven't specifically looked at that um, within our enclosures. OK, um, let's see, I missed one question here. What would you say is the optimal protein percentage in a supplemental feed? Um, that's really hard to say. Um, I guess it would depend on when you're feeding. So a lot of uh, people only feed supplemental feed um, starting in the late spring um, through the early fall or late summer. Um, so at that time, I think your feed should be about um, between 12 to 16 percent protein. Um, but it just kind of depends on where you're at, too. OK. Uh, did y'all notice any recognizable difference between the various feeder designs? Um, so in the previous phase, they did have two different types of feeders. They had a trough feeder and then a gravity-fed um, feeder with spouts. I'm not sure. Um, I do think that deer are more likely to use a feeder with the spouts because they can um, see across or through the feeder better than say one that's got um, that divider with a with a trough because um, they they're going to want to be constantly looking around looking for predators. So I do think that the feeder style could affect um, how how much they use it, but I'm not aware of any specific research on that. Okay, um, this question comes from the North Hill Country. Would you suggest food plots in addition to feeders? And if so, what would be a good what would be good for food plots? Um well the advantage to food plots is that you may have deer in, in a in one location, but you're not going to concentrate them in such a small location as you do with a feeder. So you can imagine that might help um, you know, with the social interactions between deer. And it also might help um, it may be diseases won't be spread as quickly as possible. Um, so it, it might be a good thing to use uh, food plots. Um, as far as food plots in the hill country, I'm not entirely familiar uh, with the hill country, but um, in general, I think soybeans are usually a good um, crop to plant. Um, so yeah, I would say probably soybeans or um, maybe some winter wheat. OK, and then should feeder locations be changed or moved for disease or social considerations, or not at all? Um, as far as moving them for disease considerations, I mean, if you've got a feeder and deer coming to the feeder, moving it isn't necessarily going to alleviate um, the concern for de disease transmission. As far as social concerns, um, so far, if you have a, a, you know several feeders in kind of the immediate area, we haven't seen any improvements to the number of deer that are able to access the feed. Um, 
So I don't know that moving the feeder around would, would help that either. Um, but possibly having more feeders in a larger geographical area might help with that. Okay, and then another question just came in. Of the 30% of bucks that did not use the feed, uh, did they visit the feeder or and just not 